Hidden beneath the Greek and Roman ruins of modern Lebanon lie the remains of an ancient civilization almost lost to history. Beginning in 1200 BC and lasting for a thousand years, this civilization dominated a vital part of the ancient world. But unlike their rivals in Egypt, Greece, and Rome, they had almost no land empire. Instead, theirs was an empire of the waves. They ruled the most important body of water known to the ancients, the Mediterranean Sea. They were the most skilled and audacious seafarers of their time, an enigmatic race of mariners known as the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were the first great shipping tycoons. Their vessels were coveted by their ancient rivals, and they developed a phonetic alphabet that influenced the way we write today. But their success made them the envy of the ancient world, and that envy led to their destruction. The Greeks and Romans crushed the Phoenicians, and most damning of all, rewrote their history, leaving dark, slanted accounts of the Phoenicians to live on. Ancient texts described them as a morally corrupt race of people who prostituted their daughters and butchered their infant children to placate their gods. What is the real story of the Phoenicians? And who are the modern people who can boast their legacy? Now, more than 2,000 years after they disappeared, two high-tech quests begin to find one of the most elusive peoples of the ancient past. First, a search for ancient Phoenician ships using revolutionary machines deep beneath the sea they once ruled. The ancient Phoenicians were the greatest mariners of their time. I would have loved to sail with them. And a second, using the latest genetic tools in a bid to find them within the blood of the modern people of the Mediterranean. Archaeologists may dig in the dirt, we dig in the blood. At sea and on land, can new technology and new science finally solve the mystery of the ancient Phoenicians? between mountains and the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea. Once known as the Levant, it was the homeland of the Phoenicians. Along this ancient coast, in the town of Tyre, a 71-year-old boat builder named Abouliez labors to connect with his Phoenician past. And he is doing it by building a Phoenician ship. The Phoenicians have a special connection to the sea. When we launch this ship, we'll feel it. For 20 years, Abu dreamed of this ship. Finally, a liar are about to make one version of that legend come alive. For Abu, it is a ship of reconciliation, a way to bring together Muslims and Christians from a country. Abu's remarkable effort reveals a man and an entire community in the firm grip of the Phoenician mystique. But how could an ancient people who still wield so much mythic power remain so obscure? We do know that Phoenicia was really a string of city-states rather than a unified kingdom, and that from these ports they colonized the Mediterranean. But there's much that we don't know. Finding answers will take researchers to some surprising places. More than
than 600 miles away from Lebanon, in Istanbul, Turkey, scientist Spencer Wells takes up the quest. Spencer is a geneticist with an archaeologist passion, but instead of plying the earth for clues, he plies our DNA. He is on his way to meet someone who may divulge a secret about the Phoenicians. His name is King Tabnet. 500 years before the birth of Christ, he ruled over Sidon, one of Phoenicia's most powerful seaports. King Tabnet's DNA may help Spencer discover a Phoenician genetic marker, the genes that make a Phoenician a Phoenician. Can we remove this and, and have a look? I think so. I use genetics, DNA, to study history. DNA is a blueprint. It's the way you reproduce yourself. You pass it on to the next generation. But it also provides us with a historical document, a way to look back at it. To find out, Spencer will need to take a piece of Tabnet home to look into his past. It's like being a voyeur. This is someone who was alive 2,500 years ago. And now we've pulled him out and we're going to chop a piece off of him and hopefully analyze his DNA. And he's good. There's quite a bit of tissue. There are some curious things about King Tabnet. He was buried in a borrowed Egyptian sarcophagus and mummified in the Egyptian style. Why was a powerful king from a great civilization buried in the hand-me-downs of another culture? The Phoenicians controlled the trade networks in the Mediterranean and they absorbed other cultures. Roman culture, Greek culture, Egyptian culture, and spread it as well. So they were conduits. That's part of what makes them so enigmatic. How do you define a people who don't have, in a sense... Okay. It's in good condition. Um, the enamel is still intact, so it's been sealed. With any luck, we can clean it off and actually get some DNA out. If we get a DNA result from this, it's going to give us a set of linked genetic changes that define him and his lineage. Uh, so it will tell us who could be his direct descendant. Is it mummified? Even if King Tabnet's DNA is useful, it will be only one piece of a complicated puzzle. Many more pieces will be found back in Lebanon, where the Phoenician story began. Here, Spencer joins far away as Harvard. He wants to uncover a mystery much closer to home. I am a geneticist, but I love history, and Lebanon is the heart of the Phoenician land. So what I would like to do is trace back my history and the history of the people I live with through genetics. I really consider myself to be a historian, and I see genetics as a tool for discovering things about the past. For me, the opportunity to go out and meet these people and visit these fascinating places, it's just incredible, you know, it's like strolling through the past. For Spencer and Pierre, one of the first places to search for clues may be here, in the local market. The Phoenicians may be best understood as some of the ancient world's first traveling salesmen. Phoenicians were really master salesmen. They had the gift and the ability to persuade other people of the value of their, their goods and services, you know, to make a dollar. Flashing eyes, winsome smiles, charm bordering on pushiness. Whatever it takes to make the sale. You can learn a lot by people's faces. You see people interacting with each other, and it's a reflection of a culture. It's a reflection of their shared history. It's a reflection of the way they've done things over many, many generations. And as with traveling salesmen the world over, the Phoenicians may have been busy doing more than just selling goods. As population geneticists, what we study is how people are related to each other. In effect, the history of who had sex with whom. Are the genes of the Phoenicians hidden in the blood of these modern-day Lebanese and passed down generation to generation? To find out, the geneticists will collect over 2,000 blood samples throughout Lebanon and around the Mediterranean. At the heart of their quest, 
a Phoenician identity crisis. Who were they initially in 1200 BC? What about the genetic makeup of the Phoenicians at their genesis? Were they Canaanites? In the Old Testament, the Canaanites were the people who lived throughout the Levant from before 2000 BC until around 1200 BC. Because they precede the Phoenicians and because their homelands overlap, most archaeologists believe the Canaanites and the Phoenicians are the same people, but no one has ever proven it. The archaeology of the Phoenicians suggests that they developed steadily out of the older Canaanite cultures. But it would be really important to know how much genetic continuity there was. Will this genetic quest confirm the archaeology, or will it reveal something else? A genetic link to a darker legacy? The story, found in ancient Egyptian sources, suggests that a group of marauders, known only as the Sea Peoples, invaded the Levant around 1200 BC. Some scholars believe they mixed with the Canaanites to create a new people, the Phoenicians. Curiously, it is only after the Sea Peoples arrive in the Levant that the Phoenicians race ahead of their competitors. Their boats evolve into large seagoing transports, capable of covering more than 100 miles in a day. They found colonies, build the world's first international cartel, and create a vast commercial empire. But what caused this dramatic leap forward? Did the Sea People simply influence the Canaanites? Or did they interbreed with them and become the Phoenicians? There are a lot of arguments among scholars on just how much impact the Sea Peoples had on the Phoenicians, and whether this had an impact on the Phoenicians' later development as the greatest sailors in the Mediterranean. Were they influenced genetically by the Sea Peoples? Most of the information we have is hearsay, so it really is, is breaking new ground to go out and do these studies using genetics, and of course we have to put the genetics into context with the archaeology. Their search leads them east into the terraced Kadisha Valley. Here, Pierre wants to show Spencer a seminal part of the Phoenician past. So these are the cedars. The cedars of the Lord, you call them. <laughs> yeah. In this tiny protected grove, they find what remains of the fabled cedars of Lebanon. The building blocks of Phoenician civilization. years ago, these mountains were covered with them. They built their boats with this durable wood and then used those ships to transport cedar to the powers of the ancient world. The Egyptian pharaohs treasured cedar for its fragrant resin. King Solomon coveted it and used it to build his legendary temple of Jerusalem. Cedar may have gotten the Phoenicians into the game, but they sold more than their famous wood. Everything from ostrich eggs to wine to a Phoenician purple dye that became a staple in royal households throughout the ancient world made it onto their ships. Most of these goods, this evidence of their lives, have been lost to time but where did the people who traded them go? The answer is in the blood. Okay, off we go. This tire was, you know, the key Phoenician port. There's something magical about this town. It embraces the sea in a way that is really amazing. When Spencer and Pierre bring their investigation to the ancient Phoenician city of Tyre, they have a tough sell on their hands. How do two complete strangers show up and ask the locals for their blood? The answer becomes apparent pretty quickly. Ask the people who pull their living from the sea. Certainly most people that I've encountered are really fascinated by this idea that you're going to be able to take something out of their arm which looks identical to the same stuff that you take out of the arm of the person sitting next to them and figure out something about your past. They are very interested in knowing exactly where they come from. 
It's, it's very intriguing when you tell them, hey, I can trace back your lineage. They light up. How does the blood Spencer and Pierre collect today help them uncover the Phoenicians of more than 2,000 years ago? Within our blood is DNA, a molecular blueprint passed on to our children. Each person's blueprint is made of the same four building blocks, labeled A, C, G, and T. Repeated in a string some three billion letters long, it's the sequence of the letters that determines who you are. What we as geneticists, and in particular as population geneticists study, is genetic variation, changes in that sequence these glitches that have occurred in the past that distinguish between individuals. These variations, or markers, are so rare that when they do occur, they define a unique family line. If you share a marker with another person, you share an ancestor. That gives us a clue about how far back this ancestry really goes. When did we last share a common ancestor? How far back do the family trees go? before we get to that common individual who unites everyone in the tree. Scientists can use the markers to determine when one group began mixing with another. Merci. If they can find markers that connect to the Phoenicians, they will be able to trace Phoenician history through the blood of their descendants. Merci, monsieur. Three cc's of blood from you. But finding the Phoenician marker could have modern implications. Their results may ripple through the already turbulent waters of Lebanon. For more than 15 years, Lebanon was torn by religious war. For some, even the legacy of the Phoenicians became controversial. People are very, very concerned that we're going to find that one population, perhaps, is directly related to the Phoenicians while others are not. And therefore, uh, they have more of a stake in the area. I don't know. Will their investigation confirm this fear or refute it? 30 years of wars in Lebanon is enough. I think a scientific approach to this would help a lot. That's why I'm doing it. I really want to help. I really want to uncover this. Could the blood of the fishermen of Tyre carry evidence that might help repair the wounds of war? Do their faces reflect in some fleeting way the faces of the Phoenicians from long ago? Though it may be hard to see in these eyes, even 3,000 years ago, religious controversy swirled around the Phoenicians. The Old Testament tells the story of one of Tyre's most infamous daughters, Jezebel. The quintessentially shameless woman was, in fact, a Phoenician princess. Jezebel was married to Ahab, a king of Israel. She seduced him and his followers into praying to her gods the idols of Phoenicia. I think that she did, in fact, get a bad rap because what she was doing was importing all of the kinds of religious practices that she grew up with as a princess of ancient Tyre, and that it was natural for her to bring those things with her when she became the queen of ancient Samaria. Jezebel's rise to power and the threat she posed to the prophets of Israel led to her demise. In the end, she died violently, pushed out a window by her own servants. Her brutal legacy cast a grave shadow over the ancient Phoenicians. In the Old Testament, they're maligned as idol worshippers. Other ancient texts refer to them as cheaters and hucksters, the bad boys of the ancient world. The Phoenicians were very wealthy and very powerful, and this caused tremendous envy and jealousy in the kingdom of Israel. The Phoenicians get very negative reporting in the Hebrew Bible. They constantly write about the luxury and wealth and beauty of ancient cities like Tyre and Sidon, but at the same time, they're constantly talking about how they're sink beds of corruption and filth and squalor. 
So perhaps the root of all the bad press was envy. Their rivals could not compete with the rulers of the seas. The remarkable ships of those rulers is what explorer Robert Ballard seeks. For Ballard, excavating a Phoenician hull would be the closest he could ever come to meeting them. Between Phoenicia and Sicily. In many ways, we're following the same trade routes the Phoenicians followed. Westward bound. Ballard has also mastered the Mediterranean, the sea once considered the middle of the earth. His discoveries employing state-of-the-art technology and gut instincts have made him one of the most prominent explorers of our times. The Phoenicians are the true ancient mariner. They didn't have a giant nation, a great army, vast natural resources and wealth. They had to survive on their cunning and their mastery of the sea. Look at the uh, crescent. I am a person of the sea. I have a connection to them. I'm somewhat of a, a rogue as well. I have great respect for them, so I want to find them. June 11th, 1999. Ballard has found the Phoenicians. Joined by Harvard archaeologist Larry Steger, the explorer is positioned above a site near the coastal border of Egypt and Israel. There's something coming in, but it's to the right here. Oh, yeah. There's something there. The find is astounding. That's got to be the big one. Oh, that's the mother of all. That's the mother of all ships. We're coming in. I wasn't looking at the wreck. I was looking at Larry's face. I came in and I saw his face just glow. And he said, the Phoenician. There she blows. It was the oldest shipwreck ever found in the deep. Its cargo of amphora jars stacked on a deck that now rests 1,200 feet down. This is the first Iron Age ship that's All ever right. been found in the All right. All right. Yeah. But the real revelation is the ship's location roughly 30 miles from shore. Proof that the ancient Phoenicians left the safety of the coast and struck out across the open sea. Look at those other uh, pods. pods too. Look at those other yep. pods. We didn't see those in the... Look at that. Oh, wow. uh, is that the anchor? There's the anchor, the yes. Anchor. Up to the upper right. As a seaman and entrepreneur, Ballard could put himself into the mind of the ancient mariner. If you think about the ancient mariner, time was money, particularly for a Phoenician, and they didn't want to waste time. I think that they wanted to go the quickest, fastest way to anywhere. Five years later, Ballard plans to return to this site. But he has no idea how difficult it will be to find the Phoenicians once more. Across the Mediterranean, another quest to unlock the secrets of the Phoenicians is unfolding at what was once the edge of their known world. Gibraltar. At the point where Africa and Europe nearly touch, the legendary rock juts from the sea, an unmistakable gateway. The Phoenicians undoubtedly crossed this threshold, but what did it take to traverse a portal into the unknown? Answers are coming to light in a cave at the base of the rock. Here, archaeologists have to earn their knowledge. The entrance to Gorham's cave is some 350 steep steps down the crumbling face of the rock. Spanish archaeologist Paco Giles helps lead the team. We are at a very, very wild place, and it's complicated to get to the cave. A lot of rocks have fallen from the top of the Rock of Gibraltar, and both the going up and going down are dangerous. But for Giles, the risks are a fair price to pay. Over the years, they've found more than 5,000 artifacts in the cave. But they are not what might be expected. Here, we don't have kitchen stuff or items for daily use. 
What we have are very small items that, in spiritual terms, are very large. Hiles' team has discovered what seem to be personal talismans, charms, rings, scarabs, finely crafted glass vases. Even though they are very tiny items, we can reconstruct through them the moment, the key moment of the Phoenician's visit. Hiles believes the Phoenicians were performing some kind of ritual here. But until the excavation is completed, its precise nature will remain unknown. While there are many Phoenician sites in the Mediterranean, virtually no written evidence has ever been excavated. In fact, not a single original Phoenician manuscript has survived, leaving them mute and defenseless throughout the millennia. The Phoenicians had the unlucky fate of sharing the Mediterranean with two jealous foes, the ancient Greeks from 1200 BC and the ancient Romans from 300 BC. Much of what we do know of their rites and rituals comes from the damning words of these rivals. The Greek historian Herodotus described a ritual, a kind of institutionalized one-night stand, much like what happened in Phoenicia. Every woman must sit in the temple and associate, once in her life, with a strange man. When she has given herself, she has fulfilled her duty to the goddess and returns home. I think from these people we get a very skewed look at the Phoenicians. The kind of religion that they were practicing. History is portrayed in their sculpture. The consummate salesman, Phoenicians reveal a chameleon-like nature, mimicking the taste of their clients. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Israelites. Though they may appear disingenuous, one discovery at the Temple of Eshman reveals a more sincere Phoenician. Phoenicians with... Phoenician families, barterers to the end, had these life-size figures sculpted as a plea for a cure. They think of Eshmon as a kind of a pediatrician for uh, young children and that those statues were actual offerings for the well-being or a cure for a disease uh, afflicted a young person. Eshwin's temple is just outside of Sidon, one of the wealthiest and most powerful in the chain of coastal city-states that made up ancient Phoenicia. For five years, Lebanese archaeologist Claude Dumet Sirhal has been digging at Sidon. Sidon, mentioned in the Odyssey, mentioned 35 times in the Bible, one of the greatest cities of the Levant and one of the main harbors, and never excavated. What is so special to this site is the continuous ex occupation from the end of the fourth millennium right to the first millennium. She has uncovered an incredible find, a man who died in the early days of Phoenician history, the time of the Canaanites. But more importantly, this is just one of 36 graves unearthed at Sidon. For Spencer and Pierre, the discovery of another skeleton could mean a chance for more ancient DNA, but the discovery of over 30 skeletons is a genetic gold mine. It could be a major break in the case for the geneticists. If only they can convince Claude to share some teeth. We're gonna find her. Just the floor down here. Hey, Spencer, it's right there. Yeah? Amazing. See two teeth falling. You see them? Yeah. Well, let's go find her. 
Okay. I really want to get these two, two teeth here. I mean, they're falling apart. I mean, it's not part of the skeleton anymore. <laughs> That's what I'll tell her. Well, hopefully she'll see it that way. It's very, very difficult to get DNA material out of these skeletal remains. But if you can do that, it's invaluable. It's, it's fantastic data. Archaeologists couldn't dig here for 15 years because of the civil war in Lebanon. But now, Claude's site may give her a first glimpse of the Phoenician's ancestors in Sidon. This is that down there we have, we go from the end of 4000 BC till uh, the 5th century BC. But the importance of the site may actually work against Spencer and Pierre. Their research may have to take a back seat to scientists who have waited more than a decade to study such a find. There isn't a place in the whole of Lebanon where you can excavate the third millennium with this facility. Yeah. It's a highway for third millennium. <laughs> it's fantastic. Burial's just started. So we can sit together, see what you need. How much time would that be to say, okay, now I can give you a sample? It how depends much how much you about? need and, and how much it will take them. You see, I don't I think... Need uh, yes, I know. Perhaps betraying his Phoenician roots, Pierre tries to cut a deal. There are two right here that are falling off. You're having ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I have my stuff. If Only when your back is turned, though. <laughs> you actually need a population. So you need to look at variation across a group of individuals, perhaps at 1500 BC, the time of the Canaanites, and another one perhaps at 800 or 600 BC, the time of the Phoenicians, and see if perhaps there's continuity between those populations, if there's a genetic difference. And that gives us a check, a way of confirming the results that we get from the blood. But you know, I mean, you're a great uh, archaeologist. I mean, it's, they know. I mean, it's a pleasure it's for a us nice and an honor site. for us to work with you. I mean, it's I, a very nice site. It's a chance. It's a time machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was very promising. Oh, excellent. 30 samples. Promising as the site may be to Spencer and Pierre, it is even more promising to other scientists. They find they will be last in line to study the remains. With the trail for ancient Phoenician DNA gone cold, Spencer and Pierre have to plot out their next move. A few hundred miles away, explorer Robert Ballard's troubles are far more serious. So I was going to have them over there. Ballard had planned to return to the Phoenician wrecks found in 1999. Then we this time with a remarkable new machine, the remote excavator Hercules. The breakthrough technology would allow him to be the first to fully excavate the earliest Phoenician ships ever found in the deep. But it's not going to happen. Ballard is stymied by international politics. Last time we were here, which was in 1999, Israel said that we were off their coast and they came out with a gunboat and that's pretty convincing and they also sent observers but they said but you're beyond our territorial waters therefore you don't have to ask permission you're beyond our territorial claims but then the law changed and the border shifted and it became Egyptian waters was awaiting final permission from the Egyptians when the elusive Phoenicians slipped away again. All of a sudden we get a letter from our State Department, Cairo, saying that the Egyptian military deems our mission a threat to the national security of Egypt. Wow, that's amazing. I don't think we'll ever get back to those two ships. And they were very important ships. No one had ever found Phoenician ships. So basically, we're back to square one. Instead of pulling the plug, Ballard decides to take to the hunt. One of his new targets is an ancient sea lane between the island of Malta and Phoenicia's greatest colony, Carthage. In about 800 BC, the Phoenicians extended their reach across the Mediterranean and founded Carthage, which means new city in Phoenician. 
From its Phoenician roots, the colony grew to dominate the region, eventually surpassing the power of its founders. For Spencer and Pierre, Carthage holds a natural appeal. It was a major Phoenician settlement That's for right. hundreds of years. That's right. And so you have a gradual diffusion of genus by south from Carthage. Go to the places that were identified in historical sources as being Phoenician settlements, places like Carthage. Sample people there, look at the genetic lineages they have, and see if any of those could trace back to Lebanon. The blood taken here will be some of the last collected for this phase of the research. Spencer and Pierre will then begin the lengthy, tedious business of analyzing the genetic data. Meanwhile, Ballard is trawling along an ancient trade route between Malta and Carthage. So that range is back to the spot, right? The search area is a sea lane over a hundred miles long. And while the chance of finding a Phoenician wreck in the open sea is small, it's still the only chance Ballard has. Right where we're headed right now, right? Great hunting ground for shipwrecks. We know the Phoenicians passed through this gauntlet countless times, and statistically, many didn't make it. And this is the place to find them. Ballard searches using an optical imaging system he calls Argus. Jim, do you hear me? Yep. You can get back up to seven. Going up okay, to seven. soft bottom as expected. Argus lets Bob walk along the sea floor like a prospector looking for gold. Now, do we have a distance that we've traveled since we started? With his array of technology, Ballard's ship is a far cry from the wooden boats of the Phoenicians. These people were at one with the sea. I'm barely connected to the sea when I'm surrounded with technology like this. So I would have loved to sail with them. I, I would have just sat there and watched. Ballard would have sat alongside mariners who held a vast and intimate knowledge of the entire night sky. Many scholars believe they were the first navigators to identify the North Star and to use it to find their way. Guided by the angle of the sun, the flight of birds, the coolness and wetness of a breeze, their minds were their compass. But despite their finely tuned skills, Ballard knows the sea still claimed the lives of many. Yeah. You slow down a little, I think. Uh, that doesn't make finding them any easier. Well, I've sure seen a lot of this in my life. Lots and lots of mud. That looked like wood. She stopped me. I dropped the ship. The search reveals nothing right but a few here. false alarms. Look at that big anchor. Ship that looks up right here. Yeah, that's a, uh, not that old a ship, but well, I'll be darned. That's a modern boat. Yeah, it's modern. Well, we'll keep plugging away. Only got four million miles to go. <laughs> the Mediterranean covers almost a million square miles of Earth. Ancient records say that by 1100 BC, the Phoenicians reached its western gateway near Gibraltar. They called this place the Pillars of Melkart, named for their primary deity and the god of storms. Before the Phoenicians, very few people from the Mediterranean had sailed far into the Atlantic. This must have been the most terrifying experience for ancient sailors. To reckon with their fear, Phoenician sailors would have struck some kind of spiritual bargain. Evidence of that bargain is exactly what archaeologist Paco Giles has found. Proof that fear is what filled this cave with charms. The Phoenician navigators came here and personally made an offering to create an alliance, a kind of marriage between the deities, the sea gods, 
and them the navigators. They made these offerings to the deities to gain their support and protection for the difficult passage through the Straits of Gibraltar to the end of their world. The posh factor was that they lived on the edge of great empires which were constantly demanding tribute from them. They had to produce wealth to pay their conquerors. The pole factor was that they could make great wealth for themselves as well. At the cusp of the Iron Age, the ancient world's desire for metal was growing and the Phoenicians were eager to discover new sources. It was that huge and growing up. They ventured beyond the pillars. They didn't stop. Herodotus wrote of Phoenicians who circumnavigated Africa around 600 BC, some 2,000 years before Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama. Another account tells of an expedition to Western Africa the captain wrote of seeing crocodiles, hippos, and women with shaggy bodies called gorillas. The explorers skinned three of them. The Phoenician navigator Himilco allegedly braved the Atlantic's rough seas as far as the coast of Britain, all in pursuit of tin. If these accounts are valid, then it is the Phoenicians who started the first age of Western exploration, centuries before the birth of Christ. The most amazing thing about the Phoenicians is not so much that they uh, invented maritime trade, but that they actually pushed the, the whole boundaries of, of commercial trade far beyond what anybody had done before. of that glorious past has eluded Robert Ballard. His search along the ancient sea lane near Carthage has left him empty-handed. Yeah, I haven't yeah, been able to reach him either. But for yeah, Ballard, the game isn't down. over yet. He knows a place where he can find the next best thing, Roman wrecks that he believes were based on Phoenician design. He's going on more than a hunch. Rome coveted Phoenician ships and the trade routes, an envy that would lead to conflict with Carthage and to the final chapter of Phoenician history. Carthage was the most terrifying enemy the Romans had ever had to face. It was a great naval power, whereas the Romans had really no ships at all. Envy and jealousy of the Carthaginians' wealth probably played a large role in the way the Romans in particular painted Carthage as an evil and corrupt society. Ancient writers claimed that on moonlit nights, Carthaginian priests offered a living child as a sacrifice to the gods in times of war, famine, or plague. Flutes, tambourines, and lyres drowned out the parents' cries. Their ashes and bones were put in a small urn and placed with others in the sacrificial burial ground of their goddess. We know that the Israelites and the Greeks and the Romans hated Phoenicia and Carthage and constantly went out of their way to paint the Phoenicians negatively. But it's surprising that they all picked on the same story. So surprising, in fact, that many scholars think that there must be something to this. the accounts come from their rivals, the archaeology appears damning. The evidence that people have found that the Carthaginians really did sacrifice babies does seem to be quite strong. In cemeteries that the Carthaginians called Tophets, they found the burned bones of babies buried inside pots. Since the 1920s, archaeologists have uncovered 20,000 of these burial jars must have stoked Roman hatred for Carthage. Imperial envy, perhaps bolstered by moral outrage, led to war. 
but Carthage was a formidable enemy. The Phoenician colony had evolved into an unrivaled naval power. Their sleek fighting galleys were the ultimate warships of the ancient world. With multiple levels of rowers and a bow encased in bronze for ramming, they could wreak havoc on enemy fleets. But even more impressive was the harbor where they were birthed. Constructed at the pinnacle of Carthaginian power, the harbor boasted sections for both commercial and naval vessels. Surrounding a tower on a man-made island were slips for more than 150 warships. This was the heart of their maritime power. Nothing threatened Rome more. The two ancient superpowers battled for over 100 years in what were called the Punic Wars. In 146 BC, Rome finally routed their navy and sacked Carthage, destroying what had started 700 years earlier as a Phoenician colony. Rome now ruled the Mediterranean, and its ships sailed freely throughout the sea. Bob Ballard, now poised for a last-ditch effort, is anchored over two of them. Yeah, well, this is where the uh, Punic Wars were fought. Ancient accounts give Ballard hope. Somewhere here, there's... He knows the Romans were so jealous of Phoenician ships that they once captured a Carthaginian fleet and copied each ship plank by plank. Ballard's intentions are a little less ambitious. He plans to use the excavator Hercules to remove the numerous artifacts on the surface of the wreck. Then look beneath them at key parts of the hull. We've got zero speed, we're settling right on target. Yeah, roger that, we're right over the wrecks. But Ballard must have angered one of the Phoenician gods because on this expedition, he just can't get a break. Oh, geez, I have no hydraulic pressure. That can't uh, be right. That can't be right. Look at bubble cam. I have no hydraulic pressure, Jim. I have no hydraulic we're pressure. Aborted. We have... No, we're, yeah. we're dead. We're dead. In the space of a few days, the revolutionary excavator suffers back-to-back -back and ultimately fatal breakdowns. Oh! Oh! What the hell was that? Oh, no. Well, that's the end of that tool. We're not getting that amphora. It appears that Hercules has a fundamental problem. We've got a vehicle that gives us virtually no warning before it commits suicide. After a month at sea, three locations, and miles of muddy seafloor, the jig is finally up. For Ballard, who has always wanted to know the Phoenicians, even the most advanced technology has been useless in uncovering their secrets. Will the Phoenicians elude the genetic investigators as well? After analyzing countless blood samples, Spencer Wells and Pierre Zalua have identified a set of genetic markers, the genes that define a Phoenician as a Phoenician. For the first time, we've actually been able to identify a set of what we're calling Phoenician genetic lineages. And these will allow us to trace the spread of this ancient seafaring population around the Mediterranean and perhaps even beyond. Following these lineages, they make a curious discovery about Carthage. In the greatest of Phoenician colonies, they find genetic evidence that less than 20% of today's population carries the Phoenician marker. What does that mean? It could mean that a very small group of Phoenicians, an elite, ruled a very large population in Carthage, and therefore they simply didn't have a huge genetic impact there. 
The other possibility is that the Romans, when they came in and wiped out Carthage, could have decimated the population carrying these Phoenician lineages, and we simply don't see them today. Spencer and Pierre can also cast new light on the Phoenicians' earliest days. They put to rest the controversial theory about the Phoenicians and the Sea Peoples. The marauding Sea Peoples may have jump-started Phoenician culture, propelling their great leap forward. But the scientists have found no genetic evidence that the Sea Peoples mixed with the Phoenicians. the most powerful revelation comes for the people of Lebanon. The study reveals that today's Lebanese, the Phoenicians, and the Canaanites are one and the same people. The Phoenicians were here long before the time of Christ and Muhammad. And what the genetic results are, are telling us definitively is that today's Lebanese people, whether they're Christians or Muslims, are all tied together in this single gene pool. They're all part of one big family. So the genetic results are pulling people together, not ripping them apart. Ten years from now, when my little daughter is going to open the history book and she's going to read about the people who lived here, she will read about the Phoenicians. It's our heritage. For boat builder Abu Liaz, whose ship of reconciliation is about to set sail, this shared heritage rests at the keel of his ship. Both Muslim and Christian fishermen, hand-picked by the boat builder, are sailing his ship for the first time. There's no better feeling. I've achieved my dream. Before this moment, I didn't understand the Phoenicians. Now I know and understand them as sailors and as humans. While science has revealed that they are all connected by blood, these modern Phoenicians are bound even tighter by the sea. Something Abu Liaz seemed to know all along.